So, other things. Um, books for sale. Books for sale. Oh. I've got books for sale yes. from people I'm reading. A good collection tonight by the look of it. I've got, still got loads of copies of the Space in Scotland magazine. Also a huge pile of mine. Um, next talk is not on the second Friday of the month, it's on the third Friday, which is the 15th, I believe. And it's our Christmas quizzy thing done by Graham, but not Graham Young this year, Graham McAteer has taken over. Oh, the, uh, oh right. Oh, yeah. Just this year. Oh. Just this year. <laughs> Just this year. Uh, <laughs> due, due to uh, <laughs> an unfortunate scheduling mis mix up, which meant it was coming and going in this way and that way. But it's all worked out anyway. So, <laughs> it's all going to run. Yeah. It's all going to run. Too many, too many confusions. It's a lot of confusion. Anyway, um, we'll, we'll now take a little trip to Jungle Bank, courtesy of Bill, who will tell us about his adventures. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, Right, well, hopefully the first part of the light sounds pretty lovely. I'll be asking Graham to put them on every now and again so I can read my notes. Well, back, back in the spring uh, of this year, um, I went on holiday to Manchester with, with family, and I only went on condition I could visit Georgia Bank. I was not realising that Georgia Bank was, right, was not right in the centre of Manchester. Um, so, uh, <coughs> I went to rely on public transport. Um, eventually, we got a train to, um, oh, what's the name of the place? It's in Cheshire. Georgia Bank Station? No, it's not Georgia Bank Station. It's a well known place. Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, we got the train to there, and sure enough, there was. A taxi, a taxi sitting outside. So went and said, uh, "Can you take us to George Will Bank?" He says, "It'll cost you no, so much, twenty-five quid hey. each way." Oh, <laughs> and right enough, a good half hour journey. Was he a Scotsman? Was he? <laughs> he was very pleased, though. <laughs> 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 that was our customer. <laughs> so anyway, we got to George Will Bank. It, it is out of the way, and that's for a good reason. It's uh, it's there to. Uh, be as far away from radio sources as possible, radio interference. <coughs> if you think we've got in bad as <coughs> astronomers, it's nothing compared to what the radio astronomers have to be on with in terms of noise. Anyway, see if I can get yeah. Ken's. No, that's the, that's the laser. Right. Right and left. Right and left. So, try the right. and trotted up this path, this is my, my good wife here, and I uh, won't tell you about the bad one, but that's my good joke. So people get the goodies And we got the first view of the backside of the, the Lovell Telescope, which is an impressive beast, I think. And it's an absolutely lovely path that it's in. Um, tell you more about the See if this works right, again. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, so, uh, Once it goes, there's a sign. <laughs> Um, George Will Bank Discovery Centre, that's the visitor centre, and more about the visitor centre uh, and on. Um, so yeah, the toilets are in the space pavilion in front of me. Uh, so it, 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 it's really a very pleasant place on a, on a nice day. It's, it's got all sorts of uh, displays. Principles of product and have all the reflectors there. So she was stood and uh, told me what to do. And I stood at the other end at that one and oh, heard, yeah. heard every breath. <laughs> oh! <laughs> so this is, this is, oh, hang on. I should be pressing the original one. Yeah. That, that's the one that she's standing bellowing into. Oh, Sorry, see. whispering into. <laughs> and that's the one that eventually I stood out to pick up the whispers. So it's quite a nice demo. It's aimed at uh, members of the general public, of course. <coughs> um, here's a wooden model of the, the Lovell Telescope, which is 250 feet diameter, the real one. Uh, it's only you carves holes in the rest of the time. <laughs> that's right, yeah. a wood turner made this. Yeah. Um, 
And it's showing just how it moves, because of course they don't normally move it when visitors are there. <laughs> doesn't <laughs> demonstrate it anyway. Does that door stop in the doorway? Um, probably. Yes, it looks like it doesn't. <laughs> it's, it is. It, it, uh, and then the, well, we went to this absolutely excellent talk about black holes and supernovae given by this guy who was a very personable bloke. Um, he explained things so well. It was just incredible. One of the things I'd never understood, I never had a conceptual idea of, is the idea of the bounce in a supernova. Now, what happens in a supernova is when it runs out of fuel, when it can't make any heavier elements in the centre of the star, it stops all of a sudden. It's got an iron core and it needs a hell of a lot to turn the iron into anything heavier. So it's got an iron core, no radiation coming out of it, and the whole thing collapses at a good fraction of the speed of light. It's almost impossible to conceive of, but that's what happens. The star just suddenly stops, boink, and it goes, and the bounce back is even worse than the fall in, and that's the supernova. And the guy demonstrated this, I wish I'd thought to buy a football, <laughs> but if you get a football, or a baseball, basketball rather, um, and balance a tennis ball on top of it with the aid of a wee blue type ring if you like, and drop the football from say chest height to the floor, it goes down, deforms, and then shoots the tennis ball up so that it hits the ceiling. Well, so this for oh, something yeah, to try yeah. it home. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's the bounce back. Yeah. <laughs> Same idea as a supernova. <laughs> so the light stuff on the top, <laughs> the hydrogen <laughs> on the top, right, not hydrogen, whatever is on the top of the star, the lighter elements on the top of the star, and blast it off into space with the bounce, bounce back from the, the iron core of the supernova. Just so I, 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 you know, I, I knew in theory what happened, but I couldn't actually visualise it until this guy showed it. Anyway, worth going to hear him speaking in his career. Yeah. Um, now, all round the park are uh, boards like this, telling you all about everything you might want to know. <laughs> Most of it you wouldn't want to know. But I, I was actually quite fascinated uh, by Bernard Lovell's tree collection. There's an arboretum there that, that he planted. Um, in case you're, you're young, huh? <laughs> Bernard Lovell was the man who built Jordan Bank. <laughs> so Bernard Lovell died in 2012. Um, quite a guy. Uh, this is a, a hornbeam tree that he planted, for those of you who are into your trees. Uh, and then getting closer to the Royal Hotel. Look at the excitement in your face. Oh, absolutely. It's a classic holiday photo, you know. I can hardly wait to see the front side of it, see if there's a big smiley face on it. <laughs> no smiley face. <laughs> That's the front side of the dish. Um, it's had, I think, two new surfaces since it was originally built in 19... I think it was completed in 1957. Yeah, just before Sputnik one. Yeah. Um, and of course... Oops. That's the, the receiver there, at the focus of the big paraboloid there. That paraboloid is accurate to within a third of a millimetre. Absolutely incredible piece of, of work for something 250 feet across. And all the gravitational forces want, making it want to deform, it's accurate to within a third of a millimetre, which is incredible. Um, and to think when Lovell started planning this telescope, they were going to have chicken wire for the mm. reflecting <laughs> surface. You know, accuracy of about three feet or something. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he got his way. Um, here's the railway tracks around the bottom that the, uh, the whole caboodle uh, revolves around. Huge, huge, heavy uh, beasts of, of oops, hang on, of trolleys there. And the tracks themselves were laid back in the 1950s to an accuracy of, it's perfectly horizontal to within two millimetres, which again is incredible. Especially when you consider this field was semi bog it was marshland. So there's huge piles going down, God knows how many feet underneath that to support it. 
phenomenal. Yes, And there's another track in the centre to, su to support the middle. <laughs> the, the bit that holds the motors to drive the, the altitude gears. Um, yeah, so that's the side view and you can see the this big sector of a circle which has teeth on it if you look very <laughs> closely at it. And these are driven by motors uh, in the base there. But uh, just there, one, one drive to put it up and down in altitude. Oh, and then, uh, so it's uh, incredibly that massive. Uh, of course, they were building it shortly after World War II, so an awful lot of the stuff was, you know, things that had been taken off ships and submarines and so on. Uh, at one time, they had a when they were going to move the telescope, there was a sort of klaxon thing went off to warn people don't stand in front of the, the trolleys. Uh, and this was uh, one of these crash dive klaxons from a submarine. <laughs> <laughs> And then there's the view of the central part, which houses the motors that drive the big <coughs> sector here. And it has, has its own rails and uh, trolleys holding it, uh, holding it in place. Because of course the length of that, uh, that structure there is uh, getting on to 300 feet. So 300 feet? Though. Yeah. That's actually it's a 2 millimeter. <coughs> yes, it's just amazing. No wonder the damn thing cost about 20 times as much as the original yesterday. There we go. Uh, oops. Um, a beautiful setting. I thought this was Bobby with the flowers in the front. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the car park for rich folk that can't afford the taxi. <laughs> 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 There's uh, another of these, these boards that are all over the place about it's a bit on a bubble. He's got his hat on as well. He's got his bucket on. It must be a sunny day. I think it's called the deep sunburn. I, I, I risked sunburn myself. Um, there's the, the telescope halfway built. Uh, that would be about early 50s. Um, the thing about the radio sky. Uh, interesting thing, well, no, I'll, I'll get to, him, to it in a minute, but uh, notice some of the things. The Crab Nebula, Cassiopeia A, Cygnus A, and Sagittarius A. Now, more about Cygnus A and uh, Cassiopeia A than an instant. Timeline for Jodrell Bank. So, this is going through how it all started. <laughs> So, at the end of the war, Werner Blubble had been working during the war on radar, and one of the systems that he helped to build was called H2S. And H2S stands for hydrogen sulfide, because it was a real stinker as far as the enemy place were concerned. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that was one of, the, one of his claims to fame. Uh, however, he worked at Manchester University just before the war, and uh, when he came out, he went back to Manchester University. And uh, the university had actually owned this, this piece of land, this piece of boggy, useless land, um, for, the, uh, for the biology department to, to use. However, Lovell managed to blag a corner of it and got some borrowed <laughs> a radar outfit <laughs> from government surplus staff. Oh, you'll get back in a couple of weeks, they never did. Uh, and set it up with some huts at, at Giorgio Bank. Uh, I don't think this is Lovell himself here. But, uh, interestingly, this radar thing here was used to observe meteors. I think, I think this was probably the first time that anybody realised that you could bounce radio waves off uh, meteor trails and get a signal back. Uh, so he went along. Lovell wasn't at all interested in astronomy, but he was interested in radar. So he thought he would try this out, and he went to a meeting of the British, the BAE. <laughs> I can never see the British, I can remember. 
of the BAA and uh, met JPM Prentice, who was the director of the Meteor section. He was a, a lawyer to trade. He was an astronomer by inclination. And uh, he came along from the other side of England. I think he worked on the East Coast, I think, or somewhere, Leeds or somewhere like that. And he, he drove across of an evening uh, during the, the Perseid meteor shower. And uh, he sat outside shouting out, seen one, and Lovell would say, oh, I've got a blip <laughs> on the screen. And uh, eventually they found that he was getting more blips than there were naked eye meteors, which was quite interesting. Uh, but eventually Lovell went and sat outside with Prentice, just watching the sky. And Prentice was pointing out the constellations, that Perseus there, and there's Cassiopeia, and that's an Andromeda coming up there. And Lovell was hooked. He was, hadn't been at all interested in astronomy. Oh. Even at the age of 36, he was hooked on astronomy by some enthusiastic man from the VAA. So I've got him to thank for all the radio astronomy. Um, now, the two, 250 foot uh, dish, the Lovell telescope, wasn't the first big dish yet. This doesn't look like a dish particularly, but this is a 66 meter dish that is fixed. It's like the Arecibo radio telescope, you know, it's built in a, a valley in, uh, not sure, where's it? Where's it? Where's it? Yeah. Um, and this is built using government surplus scaffolding poles. <laughs> and Did you ever get them? Chicken net <laughs> and stuff like that. I don't think it cost a great deal to build, but they built it. And uh, <coughs> if I've got my slides in the right order, there's the aerial. We could swing the aerial from side to side to get a band of sky above the above the dish. Um, so that we weren't restricted to dead overhead. We could go a few degrees either side of dead overhead. So it doesn't look like much, but uh, with this we observed Cygnus A and Cassiopeia A. And then later on they made the first observation of radio signals coming from the Andromeda galaxy first ever observation of extragalactic radio signals on this heap of scaffolding poles and chicken wire. Just, just amazing. Uh, there's Lovell in the middle and his merry ga gang of men. This one was called the, the Searchlight Radio <laughs> Telescope because that's that's a searchlight. Uh, yeah. Altazim mountain <coughs> and they built <laughs> put the radio telescope onto it. <laughs> so we removed the searchlight and the whole radio telescope was steel of quite, quite a nice bit of improvisation with stuff <laughs> kindly uh, liberated from the war department. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a chance I thought that. And there he was, 1913 to 2012. So yeah. quite a good innings. Um, during this time, he, he, he actually wanted to be a minister originally. Oh, he wanted to be a church, church of England minister. Um, played the organ in the church. His family, his father, uh, and his mum were uh, lay preachers, and so he was uh, he was a very religious man. But eventually, he was so good at physics, he was bullying, bullied into going to be a physicist. Uh, but when he had the idea for the, the big dish, the local telescope as we call it now, he uh, got it designed, got an estimate for it. It was just a few tens of thousands of pounds. <laughs> this, this was in the late 40s. Um, the engineer in charge was um, Bill Husband, I think his name was. And the trouble was, this was the first ever big science project ever anywhere. It was way beyond anything that had ever been in any country ever before in terms of a publicly funded science project. And they were all feeling their way. And of course, every time they did something, they discovered, oh, that's not strong enough, we're going to have to beef that up. And that's not accurate enough, we're going to have to do that better. And they kept tearing stuff apart and putting it together again. And the, the price kept rising and rising into the millions. And uh, Lovell didn't know where the money was coming from, <laughs> but he kept on saying, yes, go ahead, go ahead. 
And eventually the DSIR, what's now the Science Research Council, said, sorry, <laughs> we've spent all that, all our money, there's no more to give you. And he was, I think at the end of the project, he was something like six million in debt. This is about 1957. The university didn't have anything like that spare cash floating around to help him. Uh, so he was getting a bit worried about going to prison, <laughs> thinking of giving it all up and becoming a, a minister. <laughs> and, uh, and then he got a, a phone call. This, yeah, I think it was after, after he detected Sputnik 1. That's another first for him. Um, he got a phone call from uh, Lord Nuffield. He you know, made tractors and stuff, I think, and was exceedingly wealthy. And he says, I believe you're needing a bit of money. Mm -hmm. uh, and says, oh yes, quite a lot of money. Nuffield says, okay, I'll pay it if you call your, uh, your centre after me. So, fair enough. <laughs> so, in came the six million quid and it became the Nuff Nuffield Radi Radio Astronomy Observatory after that. So that's, that's why I got the name Nuffield. Um, end of slides. So, can we have the light on, please? Information from this old book, Astronomer by Chance. Oh. It's Bernard Lovell's autobiography, and, and it's it's very good. He's, he's not a big-headed man at all. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't say, "I did this, and I was good at that." It was, "Oh dear, what did I do now?" <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing. It, it's just one big worry <laughs> from beginning to end. You can imagine. So anyway. Uh, I've got a timeline here. Um, 1930s, uh, Jodrell Bank, the boggy land, was bought by uh, Manchester University as a botany field, uh, field centre. Uh, in the 40s, well, 1945, <coughs> the meteor observations were made when Lovell managed to elbow his way into Jodrell Bank um, using government surplus equipment. And 1947, the 66-metre Arecibo-type telescope was, uh, was built. Uh, in 1950, that's just three years later, uh, it made the first observation of the Andromeda Galaxy. And of course, it had already observed Cygnus A and Cassiopeia. And I, th I think Jansky had already observed these things. Although, even at that time, they hadn't been pointed exactly where they were, because they didn't have the resolution, <coughs> but maybe somewhere around Cygnus and somewhere around Cassiopeia or some really powerful radio sources. Um, again in 1950, uh, I said Bill Husband, Charles Husband it was, uh, presented the first engineer's drawings of the big steerable Lovell telescope, what became the Lovell telescope. And this construction started two years later, 1952. 1957, this is the, the big debt time, <laughs> uh, it became operational and it was able to track the carrier rocket of Sputnik 1. Now, interestingly, it's not a radio telescope, it's a radar dish. It bounced signals off the rocket uh, that carried Sputnik 1 up there. So he was still a radar man up till that point. He was much more interested in radar than radio at that point. And you know, interested in bouncing signals off planets and asteroids and, and so on to see what we could see. Um, yes, it wasn't until 1960 that Lord Nuffield <laughs> paid the remaining debt. Yeah, <coughs> Pays wrong. Yeah. Three, years three years after <laughs> one. Um, and became the Nuffield Radio Astronomy Laboratories. Um, 1962, it discovered a class of compact radio sources, which we now call quasars. So that is another of its big achievements. Um, let's see. 1964, they completed the Mark II telescope. That's the sort of elliptical shaped mm -hmm. dish. Um, Pictures from the moon. 1968, 
the last one can uh, confirm the existence of pulsars. Remember Jocelyn Bell uh, and company. LGM. The, the little green men from uh, uh, saw pulsars from Cambridge and they asked Giorgio and they said, yep, yeah, uh, that they're all right. And in 1966, uh, the visitor centre, which is good. Uh, <laughs> More on the centre now. Um, <coughs> 1968, the the Lovell Telescope pioneered long baseline interferometry um, with telescopes in uh, Canada, radio telescopes in Canada. So long baseline interferometer, and uh, then later on. 1969, uh, it teamed up with Arecibo for long baseline interferometry, <coughs> which is where things were going. And then they could get the resolution to pinpoint things like Cassiopeia A and Cygnus A. Um, let's see, the telescope nearly dropped down in a storm. 1980, uh, Mark 1 was used. Uh, in conjunction with Cambridge and other places uh, to form the Merlin uh, radio interferometer. Um, then, from about 1990, there's, it all seems to be interferometry that's involved in. I think it's, is it part of the one square kilometre? It's not part no, of the array. But it's not part it's, of the array. Uh, but they are kind of headquartering the yeah. So they the push the, the, the management the of the <coughs> yes. Uh, SK. Yeah, there's a yeah. control centre being built at Jogo Bank for that. Right. But which the, is the, the, the <coughs> SK is not going to be a square kilometre. It's going to be two half square kilometres <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Fair enough. <laughs> um, but what strikes me in this timeline is that radio astronomy is gradually disappearing. You know. Conventional radio astronomy is gradually disappearing <coughs> at the background, partly because the amount of radio noise that is, uh, even, yeah, even yeah. out in the back and beyond, like Jodrell Bank. And at Jodrell Bank now, they're doing all sorts of astronomical research, uh, only a little bit of it involved with radio astronomy. So it's no longer a radio astronomy observatory. It's got the biggest radio telescope in Britain. In do you have to switch your models up when you go in? Yes. Yes. You do, uh, yeah. yeah. At least for token courtesy, if nothing else. Yes, I mean, well, you know, there's enough difference. Yeah, but some people you go in, they don't care, you know, they yeah. just go in. Yeah. So, 2000, it was uh, resurfaced uh, to make it more accurate by a factor of five. Um, and then it appeared in various science fiction films. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Was it not a James Bond film as well? Uh, yeah. Arecibo was an achievement. Arecibo was an achievement. And uh, then it. <coughs> Waterproof as well, right yeah, here. But <laughs> it was nominated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2010. <coughs> so at what point did they make <coughs> Switch Lowell? You say he was a radar man, and that's ah. where they detected the, um, the rocket stage on Sputnik. Yes. Well, at what point did they switch from radar? Thrown it out to radio reception. Uh -huh. I, I think they had both going on, but it gradually became more and more radio. Mm. Where they were well, there wasn't sort of an epiphany, as it were. And they were looking for emitters rather than reflectors. Mm. And how, big a, how big an equipment would they have had to drive a dish that size? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if they'd been seriously on the bounce yeah. off planets and That's things. That's right. I think it needs a huge amount of time. <coughs> But a lot of the radio uh, observatories still do radar operations as well, um, um, like tracking asteroids and things. Yes. So they still do, they still do radar and, and, and the Drudgel does as well. Relatively new to objects. <laughs> yes, like that. Ah. Um, my mouth that came past the other day. Oh, yeah. 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 That was rapid. Back to the visitor centre. Maybe we don't, sir. The visitor centre. <coughs> You might have noticed, I didn't mention it at the time, but all these notices and things, they're all a wee bit dog-eared and, uh, you know, a bit yesterday's 
kind of visitor center. Kind of, I like actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's like these New York sure, so your persona, doesn't it? <laughs> interactive rap music. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, they're planning to build a new knock it down build a new visitor center, and they've already raised. Uh, 21 million. Congrats for that. And if you were paying attention to the budget on Tuesday, oh, why would I? <laughs> Four million of the Northern Powerhouse, oh, 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 Northern Powerhouse, is going to a good cause. It's being added to this 21 million for the Georgia Visitor Centre. So at least I've been one sensible thing with the money. So that's the one. The one Bright bit of news that came out. There are as many people who are taking up posing view. <laughs> the hell with them. Fill us in some fun. It's like these people who like street lights. I have a pony with that, but we've now got LED street lights. Oh, crap. Yes, I like that. A bunch of people. A bunch of here. No, no. Anyway, that's. That's a lot from me. Oh, thank you very much. Really. Uh, any questions if anybody's got? Uh, not so much a question, just add a couple of bits to build on that. You talked about reskinned it. Yeah. What they've actually done is built a new dish inside the old one. Because the old one is the UNESCO heritage, you're not allowed to damage it. Mm -hmm. So that if you saw the pictures, it looked like it was a wall. Uh -huh. That was never there originally, that was put in to house yeah. the new dish. And the old one is underneath, and they're actually still repairing it because they've got to keep it in. Yeah. In, because yeah. grey, uh, grey one listed. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. The other one that you didn't, didn't mention, I was told about was the thing that saved them from going to jail and everything else was Sputnik, oh, because the governments in both America and UK suddenly realised how important this thing was mm. for not detecting Sputnik, yeah. but mm. for ICBMs and things. Oh, yes. yeah, it was, it was uh, the only bit of equipment could detect it, and uh, essentially that's what kept them going. Although my field paid off eventually. Uh -huh. um, without the uh, Sputnik, he probably would have been in jail. And he wouldn't have been so bad at the top. <laughs> and it would have been a, a red sight yeah. There was also that, um, was one of the Russian missions, um, one of the leader, leader Probes, I think, just before Apollo, yeah, 1966. Yes. 1966. They managed to get the pictures down it's through George Bank. Bank. Yeah, it was at the Daily Express yes. before yes. they even got it. The Russian. <laughs> they used a the fax, yeah, the fax machine. That's yeah. Yeah. They realised it was a fax signal coming from the moon. Yeah. 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 Yes. So what the hell is this? And somebody worked out what it was. It was a photograph. It's a fax photograph. It's one of the Russian landmarks. Yeah. 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 The, the first pictures of the surface of the moon from the surface. It's in the British paper. It was in the British scientists got it. It's on the sky at night. Yeah, look at mine. That's yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Interestingly, yeah. I'm sure. Uh, the engines, uh, <laughs> they used the uh, the what do you call it? The uh, telescope there to track meteors, uh -huh. un unseen meteors. It was huge, 250 foot diameter, quick thing. The way they do it now, the amateurs do it now, is an FM radio receiver, yeah. Yeah. and you tune it to a station you can't hear. That's what uh, um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> what you do is you listen, and as the meteor trail comes in, it ionizes the gas, and that then allows you just to hear the radio the signal. Uh -huh. So you get a burst of the the um, uh, station. Pop or something. No, something yes. like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the secret is to tune away on a distant FM station. So you can, all you do is you get the hiss and then all of a sudden you'll get a burst off the radio station and that's um, the ionised trail you need. You know, so we went for a 250 foot, 250 foot disc to a little FM. Uh, is it modern technology? I know, it's fantastic. We'll get SDRs and stuff in it, software the five Oh good. I've sweated his buckets over that somewhere. Yeah. He was also sceptical about the man landing on the moon at one point. Was he? In the mid 60s, yeah. Skeptical of the day, oh, yeah, it wasn't alone. Yeah. Yeah. There's still a few matters out there. <laughs> 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 Go on, Any more questions? Okay, oh, uh, cheers, Bill. Another. Yeah. O